Good evening to you all. Uh, I think this is a really good topic for us to discuss. And as Sarah says, this is something that can really hamper and hinder what we're trying to do within the concept of medical treatment, but also potentially in terms of kind of just having things more open and discussed in, in fertility uh, world generally. We've got a really exciting panel of speakers to kind of present this topic, and then I really hope that we'll have some kind of dialogue and discussion with, with, the, with you that are here tonight. So to start things off, we've got Dr. Katrina McMillan. She is a senior research fellow at the Medical Law and Ethics Department at Edinburgh's uh, University. Mason Institute for Medicine, Life Sciences and the Law, and a researcher at Liminal Spaces. So, thank you, Katrina. I am based at the law school, and my main research interests are in everything surrounding reproduction, reproductive technologies, health technologies, and sexual health. So, I'm really excited to be talking about this with you tonight. So, what I'm basically going to do in this next 10 minutes is basically go over what a medical secret is why we have them, and then maybe give some considerations for what we might want to do if we ever do revisit the law in this area. So what's a medical secret? Um, it's basically something that us lawyers would call a statutory restriction on disclosure of information. And this is a special kind of additional layer of confidentiality that applies to the normal general uh, duty of confidentiality general duty of confidentiality um, that's placed on medical practitioners. And just for those aren't familiar with it, although I'm sure a lot of you are, um, that duty of confidentiality is governed by a lot of things at the moment, like the Data Protection Act, the GDPR, and also the professional regulators like the GMC. Um, but when it comes to sharing with other health professionals, which is something that even medical lawyers like I don't actually really think about a lot. And um, there are some, normally patients are considered to have given implied consent for health professionals to share relevant information between each other, makes sense. But as you'll see here, there are some exceptions to that, um, which are these medical secrets or st statutory restrictions. And um, one of them is about gender recognition and the Gender Recognition Act. And that's basically to do with any history of applying for a change in gender or going through any process for that. The other one is sexually transmitted diseases. Um, that can be seeking treatment for or testing for sexually transmitted diseases. And that now, it didn't used to include HIV, but it now does. And the acts that apply to that vary according to jurisdictions, so I need to go into that. Um, and yeah, the third one that we have, the, thir the third medical secret is fertility treatment under the human fertilization Fertilization and Embryology Act. So why is fertility treatment a medical secret? Basically, in short, from readings of Hansard and the Warnock Report surrounding the build-up to this act, it's basically a fear surrounding stigma for men and women that are seeking fertility treatment in any sense. Um, historically, particularly women have suffered quite a lot of stigma associated with difficulties in getting pregnant or anything like that. Um, it's, so it's something that was seen when this law was made as something that needs an extra layer of confidentiality. So to kind of help prevent the sense of anxiety or any fears that one might be judged. Um, so I just thought I'd give you a quick history of the rule because it has actually changed a little bit since the Act first came into force. So the rule started out with the HFE Act in 1990. Uh, originally, it was under Section 33, for anyone that's interested. Um, and originally, despite the widespread publicity surrounding Louise Brown, it was very popular, people were very interested, it was decided that that extra layer of confidentiality was needed. Um, and so what they also paired it with was a criminal sanction against breaching this rule, which is quite extreme. Um, but a couple of years later, in 1992, they amended the HFE Act with the Disclosure of Information Act. Um, and if, again, if anyone's interested in reading Hansard, which is where you can read all the House of Lords and House of Commons debates, the things that they say about this rule are really interesting. Um, one lord called the medical secret rule absolute nonsense, for example. Um, it was extremely tight at the time. And, for example, there was a rule against 
sharing any information that identifies any individual to do with the treatment, even if they'd given their consent. And so this Disclosure of Information Act removed that criminalization and also extended the exceptions to the rule. And then a few years later, well, quite a few years later, we had the uh, HFE Act 2008, which amended the original act. And that kind of consolidated the Disclosure of Information Act and replaced it, added some more exceptions to the rule. And now we're left with the HFE Act 1990 as amended, contained in section 33A. And we've also got the Code of Practice, which is something that kind of A, simplifies, but B, also expands on the rule. And the rule basically is um, that information about uh, fertility treatment that takes place in clinics isn't automatically included on your medical record unless you give consent for it to be done so, except in certain cer other circumstances, which I'll come to, like um, statutory and mandatory, mandatory statutory disclosure, like uh, notifiable diseases or road traffic accidents, but we don't need to go into that too heavily. Oh, and I should answer this question, which forms of fertility treatment fall under this rule? Basically all of them. The Act covers everything that they call treatment services. And that's basically any treatment that takes place in the fertility clinic. So I just thought I would provide you all, and there's a lot of text, I'm sorry, um, with a bit of context about what the rule is. And rather than listing out the statutory rule, which is quite wordy, this is, believe it or not, slightly less wordy. Um, and so what has to happen is that centres need to obtain a patient's written consent well, that's the practice anyway, before disclosing information relating to their treatment. And also now, thanks to the Disclosure of Information Act and the 2008 Act, um, we can now obtain consent for any person that can be identified through the disclosure for this information to be passed on to other health practitioners. Um, and then you'll see in this next bit that I've also taken out of the Code of Practice is before obtaining the consent, a lot of information has to be relayed to the patient, um, including reasons for disclosure, implications, and you know, including the fact that the information will no longer be subject to special provisions, and it'll basically um, be subject to the general law of confidentiality that I talked about earlier. Um, a little bit more in case you're interested, I don't need to go over it too much. One of the things that's quite interesting is that one of the things that the centre needs to warn a patient about is that if they consent to this information being disclosed, they could, a situation could arise where the health practitioner that's being disclosed to, um, they might disclose the information received in some way, for example, if you die or if they get a power of attorney over you, and that a ch any child born from the result of your fertility treatment might find out about that in a way that you might not have planned. So, on to the kind of main nitty gritty of it. Um, these are kind of ethical considerations that I saw arising from whether we need to keep fertility treatment as a medical secret or not. So I think the main thing that we need to think about is whether treating fertility treatment in the same way as other medical treatments, aka falling under the general duty of confidentiality that all medical treatment falls under, will actually benefit patients. Um, this is obviously something that a lawyer can't answer, but um, the issues we might want to think about, for example, are, are continuity of care, giving better care, coherency of care, and um, I'd be really interested to hear as well what other medical issues um, that a patient might be receiving treatment for might relate back to fertility treatment and where the links are and where the benefit could be for the patient. Something that I'm particularly interested in as a lawyer is who changing the rule would actually affect. After these amendments, as I said, the identity of any person relating to the fertility treatment can be disclosed as long as they consent. So that, for example, maybe the most obvious example is the partner. Um, do we need to still ask for their consent? Say, say we remove this rule and fertility treatment is shared in the way that medical records normally are between health practitioners. How would that affect the partner and any information about them that's shared on the record? Do we still need to ask for their consent? 
And there's also something to think about in terms of um, any children potentially born as well. Um, so another thing I was wanting to think about is stigma, which I talked about at the beginning. Obviously, we've come a long way since the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, but there still is arguably, according to empirical research, a lot of stigma surrounding fertility treatments, seeking fertility treatment and infertility. If we removed the special layer of confidentiality, would it decrease stigma? One thing I was thinking about is the long process for consent, even before you sign the consent form. Does that add to the anxiety that a patient might feel? Um, and another thing is also, if you think about the debates that happened a few years ago about uh, the right to know your donor from donor conception, one, one of the ways that they tackled stigma surrounding donor conception is allowing for those born from donor conception to know the identity of the donor. Could, they, could the same thing work here if we relax the rule? Um, and then the final thing I wanted to think about was what other sensitive issues are not medical secrets and how they compare. So the main thing that sprung to my mind was abortion, which is obviously very sensitive. There's a lot of stigma around it. And conversely, um, that actually has to be reported. That has to be reported to the chief medical officer. And I think that's part of a kind of broader conversation that we need to have about how law and legal processes that patients have to watch and go through in order to sign consent forms in particular affect the anxiety and sense of judgment and quality of care that they receive. Thank you very much. <laughs>